Hey everybody, it is 2023. It is a new year. It's very exciting to feel like you have a, a break in, you know, how things were going last year and, you know, the ability to start fresh and try something new. So I'm very glad to see you here. My name is Sharon Chayden Glass, and I'm an instructional media designer for Sinclair Community College. And I'm very happy to bring you two new guest speakers tonight. Um, one of them is still on her way getting here. Hopefully she's just running a little bit behind. But our other speaker is Kelsey Backey. And uh, we'll start with her since she's here. And hopefully our other guest speaker, Paige Christie, will be joining us. Um, I also want to make sure that I leave time after the breakout rooms to uh, give space to anyone who but wants to share any exciting news, like a new job or um, something you're really proud of. I'd like to create some space this year for celebrating the accomplishments because there have been so many people that have uh, come to these groups and actually gotten jobs or gotten leads or um, met somebody who helped them get a job later on. I really want to take some space to acknowledge that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Kelsey. And I, uh, I'll also drop the agenda in the chat in case you missed it and would like that. So Kelsey, let me spotlight you. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelsey. Um, I am coming. I'm talking to you guys today from North Central Montana. Um, and I was previously um, a math educator in the junior high, primarily. I kind of, I was telling Sharon, I kind of bounced all around with the middle grades from self-contained to math. And we jumped like every other year until the last three years. And I was just specifically um, seventh and eighth grade math. Um, I was so dedicated to teaching that I went back and got a math degree um, so I could pursue high school, um, get my high school secondary endorsement. Um, and I also got my master's degree in teaching mathematics and I hadn't even finished my um, bachelor's degree. I finished my master's before my bachelor's, um, but I hadn't even finished that second bachelor's degree before I resigned from teaching last January. So um, I knew I had to do something um, to, I don't know, I was ready. I needed to get out of the classroom and I just didn't know which direction I wanted to go. Um, and like all credible things, I found a mentor on TikTok and ended up taking a, um, an, an apprenticeship program. Um, her name, Arafa, Arafa Damani. Um, I did her program where she went through and um, let us explore six different career options, which is where I found that the one that was most fitting for me was instructional design. Um, and I found that was the reason, or that one was for me because it still allowed me to use um, my creative side of teaching. So building um, these e-learning modules, building these um, like essentially lesson planning, building these units, which was always one of my favorite parts of teaching and getting to use my creativity, um, but without actually having to go through the execution of the teaching. And um, and then dealing with all of the, the crap that is happening in schools. Um, I don't know how else to say it. And feeling like either a failure or not good enough or that stress that you have that comes with actually performing in the classroom. Um, so while in my internship, I, or apprenticeship, it wasn't called an internship, um, we were taught how to revamp our resume from teaching to corporate. So taking some of those words and just changing them ever so slightly to really take out um, the education language. And then we were also building a portfolio where we had samples of different courses that we could create on Captivate and um, Articulate Rise. There was another, I believe, storyline, I think is something that other people were using. I never um, went into that one, but others did. And so um, learning how to storyboard and, count and putting this whole portfolio together of things. Um, this summer, I was on LinkedIn and I got a message from a recruiter 
that um, the company that I now work for was looking to like hire within a week. Um, I had a phone interview just to kind of see if it was a match. Like, will you fit in? What do you, you know, what do they think of me? And basically where you initially sell yourself. And um, so they had called me back. Um, This is on a Monday. I interviewed on Tuesday and they had hired me by Friday. Um, So it was a super, super fast process, which is kind of uncommon from what I read and hear through LinkedIn. Um, And in my interview, all they wanted was my resume. And they just asked me to basically verify that what I had put on my resume was true. You know, it's easy to put it on paper, but can I back up my story with um, solid examples of to show that I'm not just BSing them? Um, And then they didn't ask for a portfolio. They didn't ask for anything. Um, It was actually that simple for me. Um, And now I've been working there since June 27th. And um, I don't know if anybody is like me. I was like devastated to give up my summer. Um, But realizing that I was so much happier in this new job, I really like I didn't miss it at all. Um, And that, again, just like verified that I had made the right choice. Um, I was moving in the right direction. And yeah, so I've been there since June 27th, um, going into the new year, feeling great, Um, like a whole new year, a whole new career. Um, And it's very exciting. So that's my story. That's awesome. I I have just maybe one or two follow-up questions since we have the time. Um, And you were saying, you had a pretty quick transition. You didn't have to do, you know, a ton of searching and looking around. I'm wondering what it was like once you kind of got into the job and figured out, okay, these are the responsibilities and roles that I'm resp- that I'm taking on right now. Um, what are some things that you felt that you were really well prepared for? And what were some things that you felt like, oh, okay, this is going to be a little bit of a learning curve for me? Yeah, I I think actually my answer to these might be kind of similar. So, or not, Um, I work on a team of people. So in my apprenticeship, I wasn't really told that um, there's different areas. Like um, on our team, we have, uh, our team is instructional designers, but we just uh, give the blueprint for the content that we're creating. We have editors and media developers and knowledge resource specialists that actually like provide us the information. We just, we just give the outline. Um, So with that being said, sometimes there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, I had, I was working with two separate editors on a like 60 page document. um, And this was already created. We were just going back. It was our maintenance cycle. So we just had to go and update it. Um, and the two different editors had completely, um, changed each other's edits. And then I would ask the knowledge resource specialist, and then they would contradict the editors. Um, and I've heard that, I mean, within our organization, it sounds like that kind of can happen. Um, so learning to deal with, being pulled in so many different directions, like as the ID, we are just there to make the changes that we're told to make. Um, But when you're being told by three different people, three different things, um, and you don't know what the clear path is, you know, there's not a clear path. Um, So that was kind of challenging. Whereas like in the classroom, I had a lot of flexibility and freedom to do just exactly what I wanted to do because I was in a small school and I didn't have, there wasn't another junior high math teacher that I had to cooperate with. Um, it was just my path and in the, which direction I wanted to go. Um, so that was really challenging. Um, and one of my first projects was to completely rebuild an ELM, um, that ended up being so complicated. Um, It was like 70 slides on Captivate and the KRSs were like, this actually just needs to disappear because um, none of it makes sense. Um, ELM is the e-learning module. So of course that would be published online for the users. 
Um, and in that process, it was so chaotic for me. Um, it was a client facing product, so it had to be reviewed by our client and approved. And the timeline just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, but as a teacher, we were so used to working in stressful situations and having to just power forward and, um, make decisions right, right here, right now. Um, and if, cause if you don't, you're going to have chaos. And so for that chaotic process, I guess I was prepared because it felt like the chaos of day-to-day -day teaching. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I got this right. Jan was asking what an ELM is. And I said, a learning management system. Is that right? Um, the learning management system is, to my understanding, that's like the, the software that the, that it gets released on. What is, so when you say ELM, what, what does that mean? Cause I think Jan, I don't, I don't, maybe I don't know what you mean. Um, the e-learning module. So the, the product that we produce in Captivate that gets published oh, for the user to actually gotcha. go through, um, an online course is an easier way to say that, I guess. Wonderful. Um, I wanted to speak to what you were saying about, um, the too many cooks in the kitchen. I'm in a, a, a similar situation, um, to that, that I never encountered when I was a teacher. Cause like you said, you're kind of that one man band. Uh, we have, I'm working, I'm part of a group of people that is creating media for a course. It's an online course and it's not to give too many details about it, but uh, it's an online course that has not been online before. And the teacher is creating it, um, is new to the field and has is very is, is very new to teaching is a very uh educated content expert so subject matter expert but hasn't really implemented this learning for a large audience has done independent studies and um just wants to narrate slides just wants to narrate slides like for 50 minutes and um, it's it's a different position when you are like, I can't, I'm not creating this. I can't tell you what to do. All I can tell you is think this is how online learners, the environment looks. This is the kind of life that they have. This is the, what really needs, what really needs to happen in this course for it to be effective. Um, that's all you can do. You cannot tell them <laughs> this is what you're doing. You just have to kind of be that advisor and kind of try to get that buy-in so that they're not narrating slides for 50 minutes, like basically recreating the textbook. You, know, you want to be like, they have a textbook, right? What are we doing? <laughs> so um, I don't see Paige, so I hope she's okay, because I know that she said she was coming and she was even promoting this on LinkedIn, so I hope she's all right. Um, we are at 717. I, I can talk about my experience getting into instructional design. I'm also super interested in how April got into it, but I really hate to put her on the spot. <laughs> she doesn't want to talk about it. Do you want to talk about it, April, or do you want me to talk? Sure. I mean, I can just give you a brief rundown. So sure. Sharon and I were both um, English language uh, ESL instructors for intensive English programs way back at two different institutions. And um, so I, um, I was um, an administrator in the uh, program at University of Dayton and decided to go back to teaching and went to, took a position at Kansas State University. So I'm coming to you from outside Manhattan, Kansas, and uh, was a, a faculty instructor there in the English language program since fall of 2014. And um, I, you know, our program, I'm sure that any of you who are in higher education can relate, you know, the enrollment, uh, sustaining enrollment has been such a challenge since COVID. And um, 
even before that, our um, market forces, you know, uh, global market forces, the price of oil, all the things that affect enrollment and have caused um, uh, English language programs all over the world and the country to shrink affected us as well. So, and also because of some, um, some um, sort of circumstances beyond our control with the way, you know, they, they changed the processes with admissions. And anyway, so our, our program has shrunk quite a bit. So because we're all, we were all full-time faculty, you know, we were, uh, some people in, in our contracts needed to be renewed year, year to year. I was keeping my contract, but I was taking on the work everybody else was, <laughs> was uh, giving up too. So I was a full-time <clears throat> faculty instructor and also the advising coordinator. And I also worked with admissions and we also did contract work for um, instructional design for outside entities such as the US State Department or uh, third party organizations sponsored by the US State Department. So we had, um, um, during COVID, um, our instructors transitioned all of our um, face to face classes to online platforms. So I was involved with that. I knew how, of course, could. Um, you know, manipulate the LMS canvas and, and uh, did a lot of research in professional development in uh, developing um, these online courses, which Sharon is absolutely right. You know, there's a different, it's a different animal when you're trying to keep students engaged, but there was support at the institutional level and help and uh, resources in, in doing that. So I did that and um, developed two or three three different courses within our program transitioned those, those two online and hybrid, and also worked with the US uh, State Department funded courses. And, uh, you know, that's, it's a lot of work. It's really hard. Because I'm if you're not a content area expert, as, um, as the speaker was saying, you know, you have to, uh, yeah, learning to, to sound like an expert or to develop, <laughs> Kelsey, as you know, to develop content at the level um, uh, of student interface for uh, for content that you don't know anything about is, is really a challenge. So um, <clears throat> I decided to, because of some other, uh, the, the drawdowns at the university level budget issues, I decided to start looking for a different job and um, just was, you know, our, our K-State has um, an, um, what do you call it, a job search. Uh, you get notifications where you set up your qualifications that you're looking, that you have, and the universe, you get an email alert when you have these new jobs that fit your description come through. And so this one came through back in July. Um, that the, uh, the College of Agriculture, the Department of Grain Science and Industry has a, um, uh, a division called the International Grains Program Institute where they host professional development courses for professionals in um, um, bakery science um, fields, uh, grain elevator management, feed science and industry type courses, which I know nothing about, but I'm an educator, you know, I've rolled that in the, the, the uh, experience that I have uh, being an educator and developing my own courses and those for others I was able to leverage those and just, you know, point out all the things that I, the skills that I have in my resume and so I, they uh, they were slow as as uh, as <laughs> academia is really slow sometimes in getting the, in the hiring process. So I didn't think I had gotten it because it had been several months. And finally was notified in October that they wanted to set up an interview. 
had the interview as a one of those four hour gauntlet style interviews where you meet with different groups and you do a presentation and tell them, you know, how wonderful you are. And then I waited and I waited and I thought, oh, they didn't like me. And then they checked my references, my references. People told me they were checking my references. And I'm like, oh boy, I'm gonna hear any day now. And then it was about three more weeks. And so I was, I was th th thinking I hadn't gotten it and then, yeah, so then I just got a few weeks back the notification that they wanted to hire me. And, you know, they have money in that program. They have sponsorship from corporate um, partners and like um, the feed industry uh, professions or professional groups, you know, wheat commission, corn, soybean, those, those professional industries. So they have funding, whereas the university uh, with international students, you know, we're kind of our, our um, cash cows <laughs> has not come home for a while. So yeah, it's been tough. And I don't know, uh, my thinking was, you know, I love being a teacher. I love working with the students and, and providing student services, but I don't want to be left you know, if if the funding is cut and our program is cut, I don't want to be left there without a job. So I made the decision to be proactive and find something that suited my needs instead of waiting until I was desperate um, to try to find something else. So that's what I did so far. I mean, it's going to be a hard job, but I've got it. <laughs> oh, you definitely have it. <laughs> yeah. So. April, you're one of the most, uh, what's the word, um, resilient and flexible people I know. Well, thank you. Yeah. You, thank you. Yeah. You, thank you, Karen. Yeah. You, you know, in this, in today's world, you had better be mm -hmm. really. Yeah. I mean, who has, a, who, who gets a job right out of college and keeps it for their, you know, 30 years until they retire? Nobody. Not anymore. Nobody that I know. No, no. So no. you have to be, and I guess if I have any, if I'm in the advice giving mode, um, the only advice I have for people is to, is to uh, think about the skills you already have and uh, think, look at the terminology that others use to describe what you already do mm -hmm. and uh, sort of, um, you know, add that to your CV. And you know what I had, um, because my program, we were responding to all of these um, requ requests for uh, grants, um, the RFAs, um, for all these different things, trying to just keep the lights on. We were doing, uh, developing all these different courses and things. Every time they, they um, applied for a grant, they, they use the CV of the instructors that they have mm -hmm. in their stable to win the grant. Yeah. So they would ask us to, you know, can you can you re look at your CV and um, kind of tailor it to fit the needs of, you know, this course. This is what we're applying for. Can you do that? And so we would do it. So then when I get ready to apply for this job, I was looking on my computer. I have like I have like ten. <laughs> versions of the latest CV that I had, you know, with all these other things that I had done. I'm like, wow, I'd hire me. Look at all these things I can do on paper. <laughs> so anyway, so that was very awesome. easy then for me to tailor my CV uh, to this job, the, the, um, the qualifications that they were after. So yeah. Nice. So that's what happened. Nice. Here I am. Awesome. And I got a I lot nicer can... office too. <laughs> that helps. Yeah. Uh, I also want to make sure you know the next time that we're meeting. The next one of these sessions is going to be on Tuesday, February 7th, 7 to 8 p.m. We'll bring you two new guest speakers. And we are ready for questions. Um, I have a question um, for Kelsey. I just wanted to um, follow up on um, what you had said was the technology that you learned about in your apprenticeship. So um, I feel like 
every single ad job or like job listing lists every conceivable like ID technology. They're like, you must have experience with Camtasia and beyond and blah, 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 articulate all that kind of stuff. But then it, every time I've heard from somebody who's gotten a job, they're like, I only, I talked to one person who says she only uses PowerPoint. I'm like, I can do PowerPoint. So like, I'm in this position now where I'm trying to think like, how many free trials do I need to do and make a thing in to post versus what are hiring managers actually expecting and what are, and what are you actually being asked to do once you get in a job? So if you could speak a little bit to how the technology that you learned in your apprenticeship matched up or didn't match up with what you're now doing in your work. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, one, again, one thing that we were told in our apprenticeship is that like I focused on Captivate and Articulate Rise 360. And that was a personal choice of mine. Um, but as long as you have something to show in your portfolio, and then it shows that you are able to learn, um, learn these different softwares. And if you're willing to say like, yeah, I'm, I'm not fluent in that one, but I do know how to use this and I am willing to learn. Um, I've always been told that that should not be a problem. And if they have to, um, like if you get to a stage in the interview process where they're asking for a sample product using a specific software, they should give you enough time in between your interview and that presentation interview to where you can then go in and specifically focus on the one that they're asking for so that um, you can also show them that you, again, took initiative to go in and learn exactly what they've asked of you and show that you're successful in doing that with the product that you present to them. Um, I don't think it, obviously it, it wouldn't be even fair to ask every candidate to know every single different software. So I think it is hard to pick and choose. Um, and I, I have seen so many different ones in the job descriptions as well that I don't know what would be like the main focus. Um, Captivate, I'm glad like that I learned Captivate because it's now what we're using. Um, but at the end of the day, they've also offered me further Captivate training in my job just to make sure I still know. And you would think that that would also be available within other companies as well. Um, but I, I would say if you just like pick one or two and focus on those and really more so focus on what kind of con like the quality of content that you're creating versus how many different things, you know, I think that would probably be better. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was hoping to ask, uh, sorry, it's Karen speaking here. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Cause gotcha. I can see you trying to track. Me. Yeah. I wanted to ask, um, for both of the speakers that were all the speakers, um, I mean, during your application process and even now with your work right now, is it a mix of remote, like uh, in person or hybrid? What's that like with your current role perhaps? Um, I am 100% remote. So again, I'm out in Montana and my the main offices are in Baltimore and Indianapolis. So um, they completely shut offices down during COVID and they found that they don't need to go back to the office for day-to-day -day operations. Um, so I'm completely remote, but it is challenging because um, I am working on East Coast hours. So it's nice for my day. I start at 6.30 and I'm done by 2.30. So I have a short, you know, I'm done early in the afternoon. Um, but one thing that I don't have with the remote is just complete flexibility on my schedule. I still have to be on from like 6.30 to 2.30 every day. Those are my set hours so I can make meetings and be available when um, my coworkers are also on in case there are what we like to call dumpster fires to put out <laughs> most, most days. <laughs> That's good to hear. Thank you for sharing that. My schedule looks, uh, so I am in person two days a week and I am remote three days a week, the two days. So I try to fit all the stuff that I need to do in the studio or with our audio editing stuff that is much nicer and faster to use. I try to fit them in on the days that I'm going to be on campus. And then, oh, here's Paige. I wonder if Paige 
got the time mixed up. <laughs> Do you think? Oh, I think she may have. <laughs> um, April, do you want to speak to your flex, your time? Well, um, because I was wearing all these different hats at my last job in the, as an instructor in the English language program, I was, I had, um, I was on campus four days a week. And then one day a week, I was at home working on um, course development for the, the contract courses that we did. My current position is all uh, is face to face because um, I'm supporting um, the curriculum managers that are within the department. They need like I just found out today I'm going to be helping a pet food formulation professor um, host his his course on teams incorporating video and uh, he like uh, being the moderator basically for his course while he's teaching the course virtually. Oh, so wow, he'll so he'll be cool. teaching the course on Teams, but also right. in, uh, using all these different um, documents and video links, et cetera. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. I don't know how to do it, but I'll, yeah, but I'll do it. That's so, so. cool. And yeah. it's, it starts on Monday. <laughs> So, so Paige is here. Um, yeah, she says she'd be happy to share. She got the time zone wrong, oh. but she's here. So let's let's hear from Paige. Hey, Paige. Hey Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm so sorry I had the time zone wrong. Okay. I did not set that up right. I'm so sorry. Um, hi. Uh, welcome, I guess, to me. Um, I'll just share my story with you guys real quick. Um, I have been out of teaching for uh, just over a year, I left in November of 2001. I was teaching um, high school theater at the time. Uh, I've been at that position for about five years, um, and then had done a bunch of interims before that in you know all kinds of different that stuff. Um, and when we went online for the pandemic, I um, the curriculum that my district bought had no arts curriculum at all. Um, so I was on the team that kind of developed all of the online curriculum for, uh, the district in terms of arts education. Um, and I really liked it. I really enjoyed, um, you know, doing that online work. I thought I was really good at teaching online and I really thrived in that position, which I know a lot of people did not. Um, but I was like, I could do this, um, for real. And so when we went back to school it was, you know, you all know, it was crazy. <laughs> um, and so I uh, started looking to get out uh, of my current position. Um, I had kind of a couple of feelers of like what I was looking for. Um, I had kind of looked into project management. And so I did apply for a lot of those positions, um, had a couple interviews there, and then um, started looking into more uh instructional design, learning and development type things. Um, I used uh, some of Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Stevick, the learn, uh, teaching, I'm sorry, teaching a path to L&D, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, um, to kind of revamp my resume and uh, all that. I did not have a portfolio at the time, so I was just going in with a resume and kind of applying to anything that seemed remotely possible <laughs> for me to grab. Um, so I had a, a lot of, um, I had a, quite a few interviews. Um, not a lot of them went anywhere. Um, and I think from when I started applying kind of seriously to when I actually got a position was probably six, six weeks, maybe a month. Um, and where I am now, um, I'm at an independent restaurant group, um, and it's actually somewhere I worked while I was in college, um, you know, just waiting tables or whatever, but they had a position open for, uh, my title is talent development manager. Basically, I'm just in charge of all things training and, um, you know, growth within the company. Um, so the fact that I had was already familiar with the company and then had the education background really just like merged the two together um, for my uh, where I am now. 
Excellent. Uh, I'm addressing some of the questions um, about Sarah Stevick. So I'm putting the link to her LinkedIn group. It's uh, teaching a path to L and D. That's the link to that group. Yes, I found her um, resume writing uh, webinar to be super duper helpful and really reassuring as well. Um, she had a lot of like, this is the word in teacher language and this is the word in business language. So like how to just kind of translate everything mm -hmm. so that this type of industry knows that you know what you're doing, you know, because like you can be like, oh, yeah, that's just like, you know, lesson planning or whatever. And yeah. they think that that's not the same thing. So uh, like that translation chart was really helpful. Awesome. And we still have um, a couple minutes left. If anyone has any more burning questions, they really want to get off their chest. Actually, I'll ask, uh, hi, April. Thank you. Thank you. Or not April. It's Paige. Sorry. Thank you for joining. And thank you, April, also for, um, but I was wondering your role is in training, but, and you said you didn't have a portfolio. Do you work with any um, software to create the trainings? Um, so that was part of why they hired me, um, because I did have a little more of that technical background. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not really in instructional design per se, like that's kind of a, a vein of my job, but it's not the entire, uh, thing. So I am working on getting, uh, some of our training materials and assessments and things like that into a learning management system. Mm -hmm. Um, but they have been kind of slow to adopt um, that process. So I've had to like really make my case for like, no, e-learning is great. Technology yeah. is good. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, uh, most of some of the other things I applied for that were more instructional design or LMS, um, administrator type things. I didn't have the proof. Like I, you know, I was one of the people that, that ran the LMS that my school used, but I didn't have, evidence for whatever program they were using. And that was, that was something that I think kicked me out of several things that I applied for. I am currently working on having a portfolio of more instructional design based things. Mm -hmm. So if I do decide in the future to kind of move on, um, I, I found that that is really necessary, um, mm -hmm. for a lot of positions. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, everybody that kind of brings us to just about the end here. I'm really grateful um, for Kelsey and Paige and my impromptu guest speaker, April Darnell. It's so nice to see you. It really is. Um, thank you everyone for coming tonight. And I hope I see you back here in February. Feel free to share your good news. If you tag me on LinkedIn, I would love to hear if you land something. It always makes mm -hmm. me feel like our efforts and time are well worth it. Have a great night, everybody.